Renfrew's first annual uh, evangelism conference, and we're glad that all of you were able to come be with us this morning. We're small in number, but we're, we've are we got big hearts, and uh, we're so excited to see what the Lord's going to give us today. Um, we're going to... What we're going to do is, uh, Pastor Michael's going to start out, and he's going to give his presentation, and we'll take a break. And then Eddie will do his, and we'll take another break. And then I'll do mine, and if I'm too long-winded, we'll take another break. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and we should be out of here about 11, 11.30, I think. Uh, but uh, we'll just go until we're done, and then we'll quit, Okay. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Uh, Eddie, would you like to pray for us? Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us here today, God, to learn more about you, to learn how to share your goodness, God, give the good news to people who need to hear it. I pray, God, that you would uh, complete our hearts, God, direct our hearts, God, and strengthen us in our faith, God, as we go to uh, share the gospel around the world, God, in our community, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Okay, guys, um, this morning I'm going to share a strategy. All of these will be different strategies. We know the gospel does the work. Uh, the word does the work. Um, just different methods. Uh, for, for my presentation this morning, I'm going to give you something at the end, so you don't have to worry about note-taking. Uh, I'll give you something at the end, and it's meant to be super simple. Okay, it's meant to be super simple. Um, when I was exposed to... Uh, they call this the gospel acrostic, okay? Um, it was geared towards young people, but then I found that it works very well for folks who have just are not exposed to the word at all, okay? So this is a good entry-level way to begin the journey of coming to know the Lord, okay? So I want you to know that, and that's a good reason why we're starting there. It was geared at, and then at the end, I'm gonna show you a video, but it's very much geared towards younger people but you can actually, the reason we'll show it to you, you can put it on your phone. So if you're sharing with somebody, okay, that, that that video may connect with, honestly, I have literally taken that app and said, check this out. And then we have conversation about it. It works. I will say it works. Now, let me say something else about this uh, gospel acrostic. It was designed by, uh, God led uh, Dare to Share uh, to design this, put it out there, and um, it's called the Gospel Advancing um, Method. And Gospel Advancing Method is is geared at um, sharing the story of, of Scripture uh, from beginning to end, and all the while sharing uh, the good news of Jesus. Many times people don't understand that the Bible is one book. Okay, it's, it's, it's multiple books, yes, but it's one book telling the same story. So this method actually ties that in. So what I'm going to do for you this morning as we look at this is I'm going to walk you through each step and I'm going to give a description of it. Then, it. then we'll go through it real quick as the way we would share it with somebody in person. Okay? Um, and uh, if we have questions, we, we can most definitely uh, talk about those as well. So... Uh, it's, it's literally built on the gospel acrostic, so we start with G, right? Um, the first thing, and again, I'm going to give you one of these. It has it all on it, okay? Um, starts with Genesis 1 and 2, the, those chapters. We know that we need for folks to understand God's original design, okay? God created us to be with him, okay? Okay? So when I share this, um, I am presenting to them that the creation was perfect in the beginning. Okay, it was perfect, it was without sin. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them to uh, Genesis um, one and two. Yes, you can talk about creation, but if I'm going to read something to them, I'm probably going to briefly share and drop down into three, eight, uh, where it shows that Jesus. Uh, came walking with them in the garden. It was an intimate, it was a close time. Um, so God created us to be with him. It, it, he's not a distant God, hasn't been a distant God. 
He was, he was a God that was with us, um, and that was the original state there in the garden, the garden of um, walking with God. Now, um, the next thing that, that we walk through in, in the O is, is for folks to understand that our sins separate us from God. Our sins separate us from God. I walked them through the narrative at this point in time to listen, talk about where Eve saw the fruit, was tempted by Satan, and she fell, and, and Adam went with her willfully, and, and he took of the fruit as well. And when we look at that, so Genesis 3, 3 through 8 is what I'll have on your sheet that you can read, study, make sure you're familiar with it, okay? But typically with this version, I'm not going to read a whole lot of Scripture. I'm going to quote some, some simple things to them, but I'm walking them through. Genesis 1 and 2, now I'm on Genesis 3. Our sins separate us is, is totally summed up there in Genesis 3. So you can also, at this point, after you talk about... Um, how our sin separates us, where sin entered the world, um, I will go to the, the failsafe because I want to so show Old Testament and New Testament, okay, as I do this. The narrative walking through is Genesis 3, but I will also tie in Romans 3.23, okay? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can all quote that, can't we? At that point, we can say, listen, I want you to know that there's not a person that, that's been born since Adam and Eve um, that is not a sinner. We're all sinners. We're all separated from God. Genesis 1 and 2 was before uh, before Adam and Eve sinned. You can also take them to um, Romans 5.12. Okay? Romans 5.12 tells us that sin entered the world through Adam, therefore all have sinned. Okay? Those two verses are enough to paint the picture that the contamination of sin, we're all sinners. We're born sinners and sometimes i'll talk to them about the very fact that babies even come into the world they're sinners they're contaminated from day one we're sinners so god created us to be with him our sins separate us from god okay and then we we get into the s sins cannot be removed by good deeds well where in scripture does that deal with the bulk of that is is dealt with in a narrative fashion through Genesis 4 to Malachi 4. The whole part of the Bible there deals with what? It deals with man. It deals with the, the law and them trying to do good works, right? And what is I was reading it this morning in Isaiah. You know, God, God's telling them, listen, I, I don't want you to sacrifice I want obedience. But man can't behave. <laughs> right? We're sinners. As the O set forward. And sins cannot be removed by good deeds. He, he, he literally there in uh, several points in Scripture says that. Your sacrifice is useless, you know, um, and your good deeds, you, we cannot. So why was the law put forward? I'll tell them. Uh, this is one of the points is, listen, uh, the law was there to prove that we were sinners and we needed a Savior, okay? So the S uh, presents to us um, that we needed a savior the deeds wasn't going to work where in scripture in the new testament is the simplest place for us to share on the s uh, sins it. cannot be removed i know you got horns on malachi's was that on purpose <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't notice that that must be in that font <laughs> but that is a, that is a good thing there that uh you know we're evil and and therefore out of that wicked heart uh, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? What good can come out of a corrupt heart? But I will, the, the place that I will sit down on the S is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We don't have to make this complicated, do we? Okay, it is by grace you're saved through faith. It's not a works, lest any man should boast. Listen, there's nothing good you can do. We're saved by grace through faith. And we talk about that. You know, if God doesn't, God doesn't shine his grace upon you. There is nothing good that can come out of that uh, in, in and of yourself. It takes grace, and it takes God giving us faith uh, to do that. I also, in your notes, put down uh, Deuteronomy 6, um, Isaiah 53, 6, and John 8, 5 through 8. This is for you to kind of be 
familiarized there with sins cannot be removed by good deeds. There's tons of places there for you to be. Yeah. John, to be uh, John 8, 5 through 8. Um, and we know that Isaiah 53, 6, uh, you know, like sheep, we've all gone straight. It's to our own wicked ways is what he's talking about there in that passage. Um, so we're corrupt. So God created us to be with him. Our sins separate us from God. The whole chapter of Deuteronomy 6. Yeah. And uh, Isaiah 53, 6. That I would use in, in me sharing, I would just use Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And to say, look, to, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that, that Genesis 4 through Malachi 4 was saying, good deeds ain't going to get it. You know, they tried and they tried, and they failed and they failed. And it just proved that we needed a Savior. Now, when we get to the, the P, is when we kind of start getting into uh, really presenting the answers, right? We see the problem there uh, when we look at the O and the S, okay? But the P and the E and the L is going to present the answer to the problem, okay? Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. It's got a catch to it, right? Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and he rose again. So we couldn't do anything to help ourselves. Now, the P is covered with the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? And that's the way they have it set up. They always separate John, and there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But Jesus paid the price for sin because we couldn't pay it in and of ourselves. Um, and I'll talk about in that point a spotless lamb, a savior that uh, a savior that had no sin had to die uh, to pay for our sins. And when you go, when you talk about um, Jesus paying the price for sins, you can talk about the death, uh, the burial, and the resurrection there. And I've given you some scriptures there uh, on on your handout as well in Matthew and Luke um, there that um, paint that picture: Jesus' death burial and his resurrection and that was the payment and we keep it very simple there now i'm really um excited by the time i get to e because e deals with every other religion okay and i can't tell you how many times i've had to sit down on e just a little bit longer okay because let's let's face it most people um have some type of religious belief okay whether it's works or whether it's some other way okay well, he deals with that. Everyone who trusts in him, and I would underline alone, okay, has eternal life. And we sit down and there's no other way. So John, the book of John, is teaching us that Jesus is the only way, right? We're famous to make that very simple. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. If I had to memorize one verse... To bring that point, that's the one I'm bringing. Okay? Now, I'm giving you others. Acts 2.21. In uh, the second half of Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, and the gift is who? It's Jesus. And I talk about how Jesus is the gift because we could not uh, help ourselves. Everyone who trusts in Jesus alone has eternal life. Now, in that, you could also, uh, and I won't sit down on too long because Steve's going to uh, go more in depth with this a little bit later, but Romans 10, 9, and 10 is a great place also for everyone who trusts in him alone because we're professing Jesus as Lord, meaning he's in charge. He's the only way. Um, so everyone who trusts in him, underline alone, has eternal life. Now, when we get to the L, um, the L here. Um, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Now, we oftentimes, when we talk about uh, salvation, we think in terms of a future. But we want them to understand that they're coming into a relationship with Christ that affects them in today's terms. He came to walk and talk with you now. Well, wait a minute, that sounds a whole lot like the beginning there in the garden, Jesus came to walk and talk. Because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, we now can walk and talk with Christ. 
I know it's a spiritual walking and talking with Christ, but we can do that. And where are we going to go for that? Uh, John 3.36, John 5.24, and John 20, 20, 20, uh, 20, 31. And then I've got some First John references in here um, as well, all on, here on your handout. But in the chronological order, what books deal with uh, life with Christ starts now and lasts forever? Acts the Revelations. Acts the Revelations deal with that point. Um, so John 3.36 says this. Um, John 3.36 is a, is a beautiful verse. Drive this home. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Possession now. Has eternal life in the present. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Okay? So when we, John 3.36 is enough to, to drive home um, the ale. Um, but the whole book of Acts focusing on the early church all the way to the end when Christ returns is the church age, right? And dealing with that, that's life with Christ now. So questions on how it lays it out, okay? And then we can kind of walk through in a more, little quicker fashion here. Um, is it important that they understand that life begins now? Well, yeah, because that brings in the whole, listen, you're not just getting out of hell free, okay? This is about a relationship. And that's usually when I'm gonna come in and say, I want you to know I'm not a religious person. I thought you were the pastor of the church. I told this guy this the other day on the sidewalk, I'm not a religious person. You're not. It blows their minds. No, this is about a relationship with Christ. And he is my Lord. And he's my best friend. And I can count on him because he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. And that's life that begins now. It's an abundant life. That's where I like to quote, you know, the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to live life with us, and it's a life that's abundant. What's abundant? It's overflowing. Do you want peace? Do you want joy? I'm not saying that you're going to get a new car, and that you're going to get a big house, and that you're going to have all these other things. But life with Christ is abundant, overflowing with the spiritual gifts of his presence. There's so many places that you can go to present this, but we want to, again, this is a ground laying share moment. Now, if I had people to come to Christ in doing this, absolutely, I have, okay? But typically, it's coming at somebody when you're using this technique to show them that the Bible was written about who? Jesus. The Old Testament points forward, and the New Testament sits down with Christ who has come already, and has died for our sins and now lives so that we can live with him now. Eternity begins now. And sometimes you can also throw in there that the opposite of life with Jesus starts now is, is if you if you deny Christ, then you're still an eternal creature. But you'll just spend that eternity separated from Christ. And you can go back to the O and say, your sins still rest on you and the wrath of God still rests on you. So, any questions on how it lays out? And I'm going to give you a quick rundown on how that might look. Any questions? Okay. So, so here's, how, here's how I would come into it. More than likely, it's going to be something like this. Uh, you're, you're talking, you're sharing, and somewhere along the way, it comes up that you're, you're a Christian. Okay? Usually, typically, it's somebody that may have a, an acquaintance with you um, that you're sharing. How can I share in about four to five minutes the gospel? That's what this is geared to do. Okay? So here's how that might look. Well, friend, let me tell you just kind of what the Bible talks about. I can tell you what the whole Bible talks about here in just a few minutes. If you've got a few minutes, let me share with you. In the very beginning, our very first book of the Bible is Genesis, the book of Beginnings. In the beginning, God created man, and he created man to be with him. God created man to be with him. He walked and he talked with man. Scripture actually proves that to us. And if you look at Genesis 3, 8, you can see that God came to walk with Adam, 
even when Adam had failed, we see in the, in the evidence there that something had been broken, a fellowship had been broken, a closeness had been broken. Which brings me to the next thing that we got to discuss is something happened in that garden. Our sins separate us from God, which means that we can't be close to God like that on our own anymore. Do you want, do you want to know God? Well, your sins separate you from God. And our sin separating us from God is all summed up in that fall in Genesis 3. You see there already, Genesis 1 and 2, now going into 3, and God has already shown us the problem. We were close to God, now our sin has separated us from God. But you know, our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. You can't be good enough, my friend. You know, you, I don't care if you go to church 10 times in a week. You can't be good enough. You can't not do bad things enough because guess what? You are fallen. Your heart is deceitfully wicked because Adam's sin, you will come into this world sinner. Even babies come into this world sinners. And guess what? A big chunk of the Bible talks about all those ways that man tried to reach God. They tried to reach God and they couldn't do it. So from Genesis 4 all the way to Malachi 4, right there before the New Testament, it talks about man's efforts, religion, to get to God. And guess what? The law proved we could not be good enough. We could not be good enough. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We did not keep God first. He was not the one that we worship. We worship ourselves. You struggle with that too, I'm sure. And listen, there's something that's missing within you. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now. I believe God has called us to this conversation right now. And I want you to know that Jesus came to pay the price for your sin. He died and he rose again for you. <laughs> you couldn't do it, but he identified with you. He came and he lived a real life. And he was sinless. You and I sin. When we get up, our thoughts already tell on us. We sin. But Jesus never sinned. He was sinless. So when he died on the cross and he said it was finished, and that's what he said on the cross, my friend. He said it was finished. The, the, the sin debt was paid. It was done. And if we ask Jesus into our hearts and identify with his sacrifice, we may be saved. Matter of fact, he promises us that if we confess him as Lord, we will be saved. If we believe in him, if we trust in him. And I don't know if the Lord's dealing with your hearts right now, but Matthew through Luke, three books in the Bible deal with Jesus paying the price for our sins, identifying with us and going to a cross for our sins. And everyone who trusts in him alone, Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Not Buddha, not the Hindu gods, <laughs> not Islam. Allah can't do anything for you. If the only way to God, according to Scripture, is Jesus alone, identifying with his death and his resurrection. And I want to tell you, the beautiful thing about what I'm sharing with you is, is if you accept Jesus as your Lord, personal Lord and Savior, life begins now. In the last return. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll walk with you every step of the way. That's why I share what I share with you. This has transformed my life. He has transformed my life, and I'll never be the same. Now, just a few minutes, guys, that I've walked through the story of Scripture, Genesis, Revelations. You want to bring in that punchline? He's coming back again. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? to meet Jesus? Or are you still stuck in the hope? Our sins separate us from God and His wrath remains on us. Now, I'd like to share with you now and I'll, in our break time I'll give you uh, one of these handouts. Um, I'd like to share with you the video that is geared at sharing this very story and it's called uh, it's Six Words. Okay, So what he does is he abbreviates those sentences he puts them into six words, and you can find this on Dare to Share or Gospel Journey uh, website. It's gospeljourney.com, I believe. So let's let's watch this really quick, and then if there's any questions, we'll close with that. It's the 
full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told. God. Yes, God. The maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance, seen and unseen, what can and can be touched, thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans, God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is a masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, a concept so cold, it's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond. Creator and creation held in eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong. A species got deceived and started lusting for his job. An odd list of complaints. As if the system ain't working. And use that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it and how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding. Besides trying to prove God is like deep in a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet. The problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer. An asthma. Choking out our life force. Forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection. But silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up the good dudes. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe. But all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection. Good luck. That's like past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank. But you can give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list. Because even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says as part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying. It's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back. You owe him. Eternally separated. And the only way to fix it is someone die in your place. And that someone got to be perfect. Or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness his death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection we all cheered because that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood stained son of man, fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone, I mean everyone who puts their faith and trust in him and him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. God, our sins, pain, everyone, life. He's kind of summarizes everything that he's talked about. And like I say, for a young person watching that, there's a lot of things in there they have to deal with. 
you may have a conversation that's just opening your Bible up on your phone or whatever else and saying, listen, can I show you what he was talking about? And many times that's the way it goes. Questions about this uh, gospel acrostic approach. Would it be helpful in a short opportunity? Now, all it, all it takes is kind of you knowing that it covers the Bible, understanding that order. Um, I think paints a clear picture. And, um, and then, preferably, that seed is thrown and later on there will be deeper conversations either with you after you share it or someone, someone else down the road. But we got to share it on we got to share. And this is what the, the book says. So we're summarizing it, summarized approach. And uh, so gospel acrostic, I'll give you guys a handout for this. Um, and if there's any other further questions, if you want to see the app, I've got it on the phone to show it to you. All those kind of things, resources. And again, geared at younger people or geared at first time shares. Okay. All right. I think we're ready for a break. All right, let's take a yes. I'm sorry, the video from it was six words, but what was the gospel journey? What, um, yeah, uh, the gospel journey .com. Dot com. Okay. Yeah, and um, matter of fact, hang on just a second. Let me see if I can pull that up for you real fast, and I think I can extend it over to the screen to show you real fast. If the internet plays nice. Dare to Share is um, is the organization um, that made it, and uh, they also have other resources on there that are that are helpful as well. Again, everything there would be super helpful for um, really older elementary all the way through high school. It, it really gears heavy at that group. The internet's not playing now, so I'll have to pull it up on my phone, but I can show you guys in between if you'd like. Okay? All right. Eddie will be up next. Good. Um, so we're going to continue our evangelism presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about sharing the gospel as well with a different method. Um, we wanted to do this conference to kind of show people the best way to bless your neighbor. The best way to bless your neighbor is to share the gospel. Uh, sharing the gospel blesses them in, in several ways. It obviously, it gives them the opportunity to meet the man able to meet every need that they have. Uh, so while there is a large number of people who have heard the gospel and have not heard the gospel, I see an even greater number of Christians who are afraid to share the gospel or don't feel equipped to share the gospel but that can change with us, and that's why we're doing this conference. And that's why we want to give you guys the tools so that you do feel confident enough to share the gospel with you. I just want to encourage you to be encouraged. With a few pieces of scripture right here, starting with Romans 1 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And then it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 3 6, I plan it. Apollos water, but God gave the growth. Acts 4.12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men on which we must be saved. And I'll be honest, praise God that it's not by my cunning or my strategy that people are saved. It's also uh, simple enough to even a child could understand it. Even where a child could understand it. The simplicity of the gospel of our salvation being in Jesus Christ, and that us being one way and then being another way because of after knowing Him. Um, so I've learned that the difficult part about sharing the gospel is, uh, excuse me, about sharing the gospel is understanding when the opportunity meets that preparation. So when opportunity meets preparation, that's when we boldly proclaim the gospel. When I say the opportunity, it means that you're being told, you feel that pull by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel. There's no question that the Word asks us, you know, it, it gives us instruction in the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Uh, so share this good news, and that's why it's good news, because it's for everybody. It's for everybody. But also, there's an understanding that, hey, 
God is literally directing me, he's pulling me to this person in this direction. So when we get that opportunity, and it meets the preparation of us being the church goers, us being the ones that, that go to church every Sunday, we've heard the gospel, and we must respond in a way um, of sharing that gospel so they know those truths. But uh, when the Lord burdens us to do that, and we have prepared, I just want to give you a simple method of sharing that gospel, and it's called the Three Circles Method. Now, give me your paper because we're going to do it together. It's going to be a hands-on experience, and we're going to go, and we're going to explain the gospel using three circles. So just follow along with me. I'll draw it up on the board. So you want to make a circle, the first circle right here. First circle, is that big enough for you guys to see? Okay, the first circle, we got perfection because that's how it all began. Um, in Genesis chapter 1. Simplicity to it. Perfection. Genesis 131. I give you one verse. Genesis 131. It says this And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The reality of it is God had intentions of everything being perfect, right? Genesis chapter 1 and 31. But then something happened. You got to just draw a line, draw a line with it, and then put sin on it. Something happened, and that's that, that separation, of course. So sin, Genesis 3, 6 through 7, which is the fall, but I'm going to narrow it down to those few verses. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they set on themselves loincloths. They made loincloths. Also, Romans 5.12. You jot that down. And what it says is this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. That means everybody. Romans 5, 19, if you jot that down as well, just for reference, um, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So, Sin entered the world, leading us to the second circle. I'll just draw it way over here. <laughs> it's not the prettiest thing. But the second circle is brokenness. If you just write brokenness in that circle. Brokenness. Brokenness is what connects us to everybody. Now, the reality of it is, all have sinned, but brokenness is what gives us that similarity, okay? Because now that we live in a fallen world, a lot of things happen. We can't explain why bad things happen to good people and things like that. Of course, that's God's plan, but we live in a fallen and broken world. So maybe my problem isn't, doesn't seem as big as yours, but where we connect and where we come together is that we're all broken in some way. But the difference between me and you is that I know Jesus. So in the brokenness, that's who I'm restored by, and that's Jesus Christ. Which leads us to the last circle. I'll just write a cross in there. Just draw a cross in there when you get it. Romans 5, verses 1 through 2. Romans 5, 1 through 2. What it says is, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, I'll write those scriptures in there so we have them. Romans Five, one through two. And then right here, I just jot down Romans five twelve. Now 
Now, now we understand the gospel, understand this as well, that you have a mission. You have a mission, you also have a battle. Soldiers for the kingdom of God, we also have a mission. And the mission is this, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Jesus says this, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That was Matthew 5, 14 through 16. So guys, we've done this Bless Your Neighbor conference in hopes that we would give you the tools to be that light confidently. What well, Paul says is, I am unashamed of the gospel. But then he also says, I am an ambassador of change. And when you think about an ambassador, they represent the city. They represent something. And as Christians, we represent God. We represent Christ. Um, we have an old saying when we're in football, um, and it's still on the board, it's when opportunity meets preparation. And a lot of times that those gospel opportunities come and you sh like showing that love and you warming them up. And those are, that's that preparation. And then you eventually get the opportunity, you earn the trust to share the gospel. A lot of times, especially now, you can't just walk up to an individual, like, boom, boom, boom. But sometimes it happens that way, however the Lord instructs you in doing that. But I want you to know that that's why our, our acts, our behavior, when it says in Matthew 14 through uh, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Oftentimes I see believers and people who don't believe People don't believe they're shocked. At. How, how did you respond to that situation? Why didn't you panic? Why didn't you do this? Why are you being this way to me? But then that, that sparked an interest. So, okay, I'm, I'm treating my neighbor in this way. I'm living in this manner. Now they have an interest in my father. Now I have an opportunity to share the gospel. So when opportunity means preparation, our preparation is the way we live, the way we treat others. In a time without, without living, not saving coming to these services and learning more, but then we're going out to be that way. So I just want to encourage you guys to share the gospel when that opportunity is preparation. How are you going to bless your neighbor? Have you ever had that neighbor that just kind of had a feud with? I remember when I was growing up, my mama got into a feud with our next door neighbor because she, I, I, you know, the houses were real close together, and and I don't know what started it, but all of a sudden, the next door neighbor just irritated Mama, and Mama irritated my neighbor, and there was this thing going on back and forth all the time. That was not a good name, uh, time to live. Uh, you don't want to make your neighbors mad, and it's more than that. It's if you can love the people that are around you. Whatever you plant, that's what you're going to reap. If you plant thorns and, and brussels and you know all this junk, that's what you're going to get back. And in this country, that's exactly what's been happening. What is Second Chronicles? Is it, if my people who call to my my name will. Uh, yeah, change their ways, pick up their cross, follow me. You know, the, the whole idea is that uh, we just be the people of God. Bless people everywhere that you go. And uh, that's the way it works. Um, what do you love to do? You like to go fishing? You like any fishermen here? Do you have a fishing tackle box? Not now, no. All right, if you got an yeah. idea. When I lived down in Charleston, they, they used to bring these tackle boxes in, and you'd look at all this stuff, and it it de just depends on what you're fishing for. And if you have the right bait, if you got the right little shiny thing or feathers or whatever, 
you can jerk on the line just right. You know the, the perfect fishing holes. You go out, you can catch it. Maybe you're not a fisherman. Maybe you like to do yard sales. You might do yard sales around here? Yeah. All right, when you go to yard sales, what do you got to do? You got to get up early. You got to figure out your, your destination, your plan, where, where all the different spots you're going to go to. And you know the good places. And you're going out and you're looking for the best deals. You want to win somebody for Christ? You can't do it. You don't have the ability to win souls. What you have the ability to do is to fish. That's all you're doing. You're fishing for men. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Okay, so what he's saying is that whatever it is that you're doing, you can bless your neighbor. And that's all we want to do. So, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you got to get your own heart right. you got to learn to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And the, the second commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And so, what we're doing is we're just learning how to love our neighbor. That's all we're doing. When we learn love God, first and foremost, it puts everything in order. Amen? So now that we're in order with God, we can go out and bless our neighbor. That's all it is. It's just simple as that. The Great Commission is go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that is the very purpose of the church. And so we're having our first evangelism conference, and we expected the attendance to be very small. There's, frankly, not much interest in this in the church. That is very telling to what's happening to our culture today. Because the church doesn't care enough to learn how to do this, the, the country is going to hell in a handbasket. And we are reaping exactly what we're sowing. And if we're not willing to sow the, the seeds of spirituality into our culture, we're not going to be able to see the, 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 the fruits of our labor. And it's just not going to happen. It's just as simple as that. All right, the reluctant witness. This is a, comes out of Peter 3, 15, 17. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy. Always being, being prepared. That's what Eddie was talking about. Being prepared for the opportunity to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The hope is in us is Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We're not supposed to go out and beat up people. We're not supposed to offend their sensibilities. We're not supposed to change their politics. We're not supposed to do anything like that. He says, so that when you are slandered, and while you're doing this, just know that you will be slandered. They will misinterpret what you're trying to do. Misinterpret the motivation in your heart. Uh, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Is that in that verse? In yes. Those verses? Okay. Verse uh, uh, 17, he says, For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. So what we're doing is we're going out and blessing our neighbor. And no good deed goes unpunished. You ever heard that thing? Well, it's true. It is true that even while you're trying to bless your neighbor, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be ridiculed. And that's why people don't want to do evangelism. They went out and tried to share Christ, and people uh, give didn't. They hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, and you're going to get hurt. If there's pain involved in sharing Christ. But that's the Great Commission. Now you got a choice. You're either going to be a good Christian and you're going to do what God told you to do, or you might even check out and see if you're a Christian. Because if God's Spirit is in you, you're going to have the passion, you're going to have the gumption, you're going to have the unction to follow Jesus and do exactly what He's told you to do. So, yeah, we're all reluctant witnesses. I don't like to witness. 
I do it because I'm told to. Uh, you know, I don't like taking out the garbage. But if I, I take it out because I get too much of it, you know, it might get bad. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you suffer the consequences. Welcome to America. That's exactly what's happening. Alright, conversion is not your job. This comes from John 16, verse 8 through 11. And when he comes, who is he? The Holy Spirit. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. The Holy Spirit is the one who converts people. We can't do it. So don't think you're going to go out and just win people to Christ. That's not the way it works. All you're doing is being a farmer or a fisherman. You're planting seeds, and we got seeds right here. You know that little Bible? This is the Gospel of John, and you, you can plant it. And what we do is, is they got different covers on. This is the same book, both covers. But one of them says, you're not forgotten. Do you get to know somebody that feels like they're just nobody? They, they just got that feeling, I'm forgotten. This is a good one for them. Or you got somebody just likes blue jeans. <laughs> I don't know why that would work, but it would work for somebody because it's got a cover of blue jeans. Well, that seems like something I want to look at. And it's just the eye. It's the lust of the eyes that attracts people to whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, maybe it's Christmas time. You got joy, a gift for you. Um, maybe somebody needs a little love. Love is here, you know, just do that. Um, maybe you got somebody you just want to have coffee with. Well, here's one with coffee on it. You know, just be, just be somebody like that. Or... Somebody needs a lion in their life, you know. I, I got the great lion. He is Jesus Christ. He's the one going to conquer you. Uh, he, he will uh, just devour all your problems, and your issues, your life. He'll do whatever it is. Uh, here's one that says, this book changed my life. Well, that's true. Just give it to somebody. And, and that's what you're doing with these tools is you're, they're just like fishing lures. You're just tossing them out seeing what sticks. And you have to do this, like Eddie was saying, with intentionality. There's this opportunity arises and you've made preparation. And when those two intersect, then that's where God's Holy Spirit has put you at the right place with the right person at the right time. God's working all this together and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life and something happens in their life. It happened in my life with a man named uh, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks had a third grade education and he drove around the neighborhood looking for toys in the yard. And when he found toys, he'd knock on the door. Sound like a pervert, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. He, and he said, we're gonna have a Vacation Bible School, we'd like for your kids to come to church. And I got up in his bus and he brought around and we went to church. And Mr. Brooks that led me to Christ. All he did was go fishing. That's all you got to do is fish. And the, the church is not involved in this anymore. It's really sad. Yep, I'm going the wrong direction. All right, so they did a, some studies about this. Uh, when, when they took in a sample of people, it was thousands of people, they asked this question. When presented with this statement, part of my faith means being a witness for Jesus. Okay, these, these were Christians that they were talking to. 96% agreed. Now, what's wrong with that 4%? I, you know, everybody should be agreeing with that. Uh, part of my faith means being a witness for Jesus. Everybody knows they're supposed to be a witness. Everybody believes they should be a witness. Everybody knows they 
think they're the witness. All right. When asked, is it wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith? 28% believe this. And I didn't put it down there. No, they didn't believe it. It's wrong. Well, 28% believed it was wrong to share one's personal faith. All right, 46 uh, believed this. And they were between 20 and 30. Okay, between 20s and your 30s. Okay, so most of our people don't believe that they should share their faith. That's a bad statistic. I, I think that's a real big problem. All right. So what does your neighbor want? Well, first of all, they want you to listen. Listening, that's why God gave us two ears. So that we'll listen twice as much as we speak. That we will be able to understand what's going on in our life. So if you want to be a good fisherman, you've got to listen to what's going on. Now, being in ministry for years, I've learned that everybody's got a story. And so what you want to do is find out what the story is. So you can have a connection. If you don't know their story, then you don't even know how to talk to them. So y'all don't see me every Sunday morning. I go out and walk around the congregation. I talk to everybody, you know. And most of the time, it's just brief. How are you? How you doing? That's kind of brief. But then every once in a while, somebody's got to tell me something. It's a story. And I stop for the story. You know, I get excited when somebody will share the story. And, and you know, it really takes a bit of time before they can get comfortable enough with you to even begin to share that story. So that's why... You do, the, you do your due diligence and go around and shake hands and talk to people. Say, hey, how are you this morning? Good to see you, that sort of thing. And when the story begins, stop and listen. And let them tell you their story. You're, what's happening there is you're making a connection. And they also want to hear your story. But go ahead and do that. Make the connection. Your story, their story, now we know each other. Now we have a, a basis on which to have future discussions, future conversations of things that are working out. Then you have to draw, uh, give them the opportunity to draw their own conclusions because you will tell them things that they may or may not agree with, specifically about the gospel presentation. When you're telling them things that we're all sinners, they might not agree with that. That, that. They may have a problem with that, that very concept. And so, or you might say, babies are born sinful. And they say, no, look at that precious little blonde girl. He's not sinful. That's the sweetest thing in the world. How can you dare say there's anything evil in that child? Well, you've never taken away their passing before, have you? <laughs> <laughs> they cry and don't come. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the most self centered little bundle in the world. They're cute when they're only about a foot long, but when they get bigger, they're not cute anymore. And so we have problems with that. All right, so uh, the other thing that, that our neighbors want to see is that we're confident in what we believe. That, that Jesus Christ literally changed me. They want to see the confidence. They want to see that you're not shaken by uh, their rejection. And let them reject you and say, okay, I'm not here to change you. I don't have the power. Don't let them uh, see any fear or failure in you. You're not people of fear. You're not people of failure. You are the follower of the king. He's the one who's going to accomplish it all. You just received a gift. You're a nobody who just knows how to follow Christ. And that's all that we're doing. All right, so what is bless? Well, bless is this book, and everybody's going to get one of these books. But bless is uh, 
is a, another acrostic. And it really gives you a, a way of sharing the gospel that is non-confrontational. You're not trying to, to get to a goal line. You're, you're just trying to bless people, you know. If I had $100 uh, for every one of you this morning, I would come out there and just bless you and lay down $100 for coming to the conference. Uh, but that would be a lot of money. <laughs> and the Lord hadn't blessed me with that, so I can't bless you with that. So what can I bless you with? Well, I can bless you with my time, my experience, my personality. You know, and some would argue with that. <laughs> but whatever it is, that you just take what God has put in your hand and you use it to the blessing of God. And that, that's all blessing is. All right, so to begin with, you begin with prayer. So B in the, the acrostic bless is begin with prayer. And have somebody, you should have a list of people. Who's your one is a, a thing that Southern Baptists put out. Uh, everybody should have one. And if every Christian won one person to the Lord a year by fishing, Churches would explode. We wouldn't have room for everybody. Uh, our nation would suddenly just turn around just like that. Our economy would improve. Our, our presidents would improve. Our, our Congress would improve. Everything would improve because the moral nature of the nation has improved simply by beginning with prayer. So take that one or that list of people and pray for them. Secondly, listen. Listen to what they're saying. People have problems. Now, here's the thing. You start listening to people, you might experience a little, uh, little problem, a little crisis of your own faith. You start listening to all the pain, and you want to take that pain away. But you feel hopeless, you feel helpless, you don't have the ability. You run into people with these terrible sickness. People are suffering. Uh, we went and visited this homeless guy this week, me and Mike, and the situation there was just dire. How, how do you deal with that? And so your heart just breaks for people. You gotta listen. But you also gotta know that God is working this out. It's not your job to change things. God has allowed certain tragedies in certain people's lives to bring them to the place where they can either receive the gospel or be pushed away from the gospel. God knows exactly what he's doing. It's not our job to fix it. So our job is just to listen. And if we're going to do our job Correctly, we have to listen to what they're saying. All right, next thing's eat. I like this one. <laughs> I like to eat. How do you do that? Well, you can, if you've got the, some people got a real nice setup at the home, you know, where they can have uh, a get together and they invite people in. If they're not Christians, if they're not uh, established in the church, use your home to bring it in. Maybe you don't have that ability. Maybe you can say, let's meet it down at McDonald's, you know, and we'll, we'll have a cup of coffee or whatever, and, and we'll just talk and, and get, you know, tell me your story some more and get that connection. But like Andy was saying, you've got to earn the right to talk. This is, this is uh, personal evangelism. It's just, just getting to know where people are and eating with them. And then all of a sudden, when you sit down and eat with somebody, it's like there's total acceptance. When you go on a mission field, you see this a lot. Um, if I will sit and eat the food that they're eating, even though I don't know what it is, <laughs> if I eat it and I enjoy it, then all of a sudden there's this connection between me and them. 
Uh, we've taken people with us, and they come and they they look at it. Hey, what is that? You know, <laughs> and you can see the 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 people in the tribes. They're instantly offended by that person because you don't like their food. Well, you know, there's somebody I don't like, you know. But they understand that there's personal preference, but don't offend the food. Try it. And then if you don't like it, they're usually good with it. But try it and eat it. And so the, there's this affinity with food. And, the, and so don't underestimate the power of this right here. Eating together uh, breaks down a lot of walls. And you may have barriers you're trying to break down. Okay. The next one is serve. Just serving people. And that can take uh, a multitude of, of things. I, know, I remember we went on a mission trip up to Portland, Maine one time, and we divided people up in groups and they sent them out to serve. That was the mission trip. They were to serve in different ways. They took one group to the grocery store and they made groceries. And they took the groceries out to people and they would not take any tips. And that's all they were supposed to do. They didn't share the gospel or nothing. They just went out to serve. They were blessing their neighborhood. Another group went downtown and they put coins in the parking meters that had expired so that nobody would get a ticket. They were just serving. And, you know, conversations start. Why are y'all doing that? Why are we doing it? Because we want to bless our neighbors. We were doing good works for the purpose of spreading the kingdom of God. It's not to say that we're good. We're not good. None of us are good. It is for the purpose of building up a good reputation in the community. We do that here with our CDC, with sports ministries, with prison ministries, with all kinds of things. Um, counseling center. There's so many things that we do to serve our community. And service is vital for a growing church. And if your church is not doing this, you've missed the mark. You're not doing the kingdom work. We have to serve our community. We have to be a good influence in our community that people can look to and say, we're better off because Christians are here. All they want to do is huddle in their little church and criticize all those people out there. You know, we're good on you. You're not good to anybody. Okay? Then the story. You got to tell people the story. What is the story? Well, the story is, what did God do in your life? What did he do in your life? How did he change it? So in order to do the story, you've got to do several things. Let's see. Yeah, where are them markers at? Try over there. All right, so when, you, when you're doing the story, what you're going to do is say, before Christ. Before Christ. This is how I was. And you just tell them how you were. Man, I was a rascally little fella. You know, I was uh, into everything. I was a thief. I'd go to Walmart. Uh, they didn't have Walmart. They had uh, Kmart. I went to Kmart, and they wore bell-bottom pants. Y'all remember that? And eight-track tapes. And I put rubber bands on my ankles. And I'd walk into to, to Kmart, and I'd pull up my bell-bottom pants and put an eight-track, hold it with a rubber band on this side, eight-track, put a rubber band on this side, and I put two on this leg. I had four eight-tracks, and now I'd walk out the store without paying for it. I was a thief. That's who I was. When God changed me, he convicted me of my sin, I had to go back and pay for those, those eight-tracks, you know, and God burdened my heart as a 13-year-old boy. I had done wrong in the sight of God. I had done wrong in the sight of, of Kmart. And I had to go and make amends. And so there was a, 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 a something that took place in my heart. It was called a repentance. 
And so I repented of my sins, and I asked God to forgive me, and everybody that I offended to forgive me, and I changed my ways. And then you just follow Christ. That's your story. It, it, if you just um, tell that story, how God has radically changed you, and he's given you victory over the sin that's and, and you know, as I followed Christ, I discovered I had other sins too. It's just not that one. And so you just tell them your story. All right. Then that also brings up, um, after you tell the story, you're going to have to share the gospel. Now, how do you share the gospel? Well, there are all kinds of tools that are available. We, of course, we've got the gospels here that. That, by the way, all these that's up here, anything that you want to take, take it home with you, okay? If you really want to get deep into how to do evangelism, this is a great book. It's by Kirk Cameron and uh, uh, Ray Comfort. Yeah, that's it. Um, this is really good. Uh, and you can go through it and look at it. But this taught me more about how to do one-on-one -on -one evangelism than anything I've ever done. This is super good. And he has a multitude of videos on YouTube that, that he gives examples of how he talks to people and that sort of thing. And it's real good. And then if you want, also got The Way of the Master. It's the same thing. It's built on this book. It's a video uh, tape that you can go home and read it. And we have a couple books here available this is available to you as well if you have somebody that needs counseling this is a great resource by J.E. Adams called Christ and Your Problems uh, you can get uh, a book like that and uh, you know somebody's addicted there are little pamphlets like this called I'm Addicted Jim Bird Jim Bird he's got two big Good books that I got. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so, a brand new pamphlet. Uh, Don't even, that one be fresh to the. This one comes from Jumpstart, the prison ministry. Um, comeback stories. How people have, uh, you know, made a mess of their life and they came back. They, they actually uh, turned their life around. Um, we've got everyday evangelism books. Uh, discipleship path books, that kind of stuff. I've got intelligence tests. This is this is a real book. Okay. Uh, for example, how many of each animal did Moses take into the ark? Two. Consensus two of each? No, it's zero because Moses didn't take anybody to the ark. No one did. Oh. <laughs> So this is this is designed to have a little fun with people, uh, and all the questions are trick questions, and you'll get them all wrong and show how intelligent you really are. Okay, because we're all a bunch of dummies. Okay, um, and this is blessed pledges. I'm gonna give these y'all can pass them out around. Okay. Um, another one is this one here. I used this back in the 70s. This is really what got me started doing evangelism. It's called Evangelism Explosion. It's real cheap on thread books, um, but it's by James Kennedy uh, called Evangelism Explosion. It uses two diagnostic questions. One of them is, uh, you to die right now and went to heaven and the Lord said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? That's sort of what Scott taught one time. Yeah, he took it. it's very similar to that. And so all of these are just different fishing methods. That's all it is. You're just fishing or planting seeds. Uh, and if you're a coward, you can take these into restrooms and leave them. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if you're... Drop them when they're not looking. Yeah. Uh, you can be sneaky about it, you know. You can just lay it on somebody's desk and walk away. And, you know, you can be real sneaky. All you do is plant seeds. That's all you got to do. 
Uh, and you'll be surprised what people will pick up because I had them laid on my counter and people say, can I have this? Okay. We got more stuff here. It got so much stuff it, it dumped out. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, we got million dollar bills, you know, different <laughs> styles uh, that you can give out. They have gospel tracts on the back. You've got these wallets. I like these. This is for the coward, for real. You, you just lay these wallets somewhere, and they think, oh, there's money, and they go grab it up, and they go, oh, man, I don't know. You know, and it's got a gospel in it. Um, they're IQ tests. they are multiple different ones, uh, and they're, those are the same principle with jokes. These are good for kids. Which one's bigger? Which one's bigger? Same. The, the blue one looks bigger, but they're the same size. Mm -hmm. And so, and it has gospel tracts on the back. Um, these were real popular. They, these used to be uh, chick tracts in the 70s and 80s, but this one's from Living Waters, and they're pretty good too. Um, there's just all kinds of stuff. I'll leave this all out so that you can look through them. If you see anything that you want to take with you, take it with you because these are seeds. They're real cheap. They don't. They cost next to nothing. Anybody need a round to it? What's that? You know, I'm gonna accept Jesus Christ when I get around to it. Oh. There's your round to it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, you hear that a lot. Like yeah. Right before I die. And, and you know. If you want to really get their attention, you can pull that out. Wow. You know? And uh, this is good on street evangelism. If you're going out and talking to people, and I said, "What would you do if you got a hundred dollars?" You know, you <laughs> pull that out, and it just, just the, the energy, the excitement, the joy. You're having fun when you're out talking to people in public. Um, this, these kind of things really help break the ice, and you can talk to strangers. Uh, most strangers, when they're in a an environment where they're there to have fun, like at the zoo or down on in Traveler's Rest on the sidewalk or at uh, one of the parks or whatever, uh, these kind of things work real well. Um, and then when you get to leave, say thanks for listening to me, you know, and just just little things that you can use. And you have to be intentional. You have to be uh, prepared. You have to be prayed up. You have to be uh, where God wants you to be. And you can use all this stuff. All right, let me go back up here. I'm going to show you the tracks. Oh, I didn't show you that. Um, I just want to show you. It's $2.49 to buy a bundle of these tracks. I think they come in uh, 25 back. And so... You don't need the church to buy all this stuff, are you? Part of being a witness is being a good steward. You need to take charge of your ministry. Every Christian has a ministry. You need to put a little money in to what you're doing. Is there you a certain need to place you get those? You can go online. Online? This is Google. I just put up uh, Bible tracts in, okay. the, in the thing. And... You just pick the one, click on it, and it takes you right to the website where to buy it. And you just buy it right there. And two dollars I mean, you could buy ten packs of that. It cost you twenty five dollars. I know the bookstore there. Yeah. So all that's available to you. Um, these are things that you can do all the time. And some people really get into this. And they've spent their own especially in the later years of their life. They, they've got the commitment, they've got a little Bible knowledge. All they need to do is to break down those social walls where they can talk to people. And this kind of stuff really works. It works real well. Okay, now I'm going to do one last thing about uh, the, the Roman road. Uh, the Christians didn't used to be called Christians. They, they were called that later. They were called followers of the way. And, and the Roman road that Paul wrote in the book of Romans is the 
plan of salvation. It is in its purest form. We've got all these other little acrostics that we've used this morning. There are different ways to say basically the same thing. But this is where it all comes from. The only thing that we're doing is we're changing the look of the lure. But this is the hook. This is the hook that grabs hold of Roman Road. All right, we, we know that we've all sinned, and we've come short of the glory of God. We have to deal with that sin. So what do we do? Is the, We tell them the wages of sin. Right? See, first of all, when you tell everybody it's sinful, they're not, some, not everybody's going to agree with that. Okay? But you just got to understand that we all have sinned. And so you've got to tell them that. Here's what's happened to the gospel in America now. The, the gospel in America says this. God loves you. He wants the very best for you. He wants to bless all your life. He wants only to, to give you the, the cars and the houses and the money and the glamour and the glitter. And that doesn't work if you're broke, impoverished, you know, on the streets, it didn't work. And, and so that's not the gospel anyway. We've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death. Now, most people don't know that they earn wages. That God is paying them for their sins. And so that's what you have to tell them. Did you know that God pays you for your sins? He does. What's he pay? They expect to get some money. <laughs> you said the wages of sin is dead. Romans 6.23. Okay. But God shows his love in us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait to, uh, you know, it, till we got perfect before he died for us. He did it while we were sinners. It's important. And then Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, and accepting the gift, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, this particular verse has gotten corrupted as well, uh, especially in the Baptist church. In the Baptist church, we told people if they would just say the sinner's prayer, they're going to heaven. And they would point to this verse. And they said, but if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, well, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And I believe Jesus is Lord. So now they're going to heaven. And, but they, their life didn't change. They're not following Christ. This is a Roman road. You've got to go down the road with God. He's got to change your heart. He's got to change your life. He's got to be Lord. They leave out that little phrase about Lord. Lord means he gets to control you. Okay? All right. And then you can get this whole thing on a picture like this. And this, this is what I like to do is when I've got my phone and somebody wants another plan of salvation, I can pull this picture out because I, I have a bad memory and I can't remember how to quote all these scriptures. I pull that out and I can make it bigger and where I can see the print, you know, and, and I can show it to them. And is this that one under a certain thing or no, it's in my phone. If you want it, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I want it. Yeah, just text me that you want it, and I'll send you this picture, and you put it in your, your photos, just save it to your photos, and now you got it. And wherever that you go, you've got the Roman road goes with you. It, and if you want to, you can go Google, type in Roman Road Bible Tracks, and that's where I found that picture. <laughs> and you go in there and right click on the picture, copy it, or save it, and you've got it in your computer. So, however you want to, it all works.